This is a talk about our relationship to things. A sensual relationship and its connection to the way we think and we act. I'm speaking about certain kinds of objects. Objects that lack the usual rigor that is often indicated for ob objects. They are solid, yet they seem penetrable. The layers and parts that comprise them are not permanently bound together. Movement hasn't come to a stop in them. The movement that we recognize as we develop ideas and discern how something could look like which is coming close to these ideas. These things express freedom, not regimentation. Their surfaces lack tidiness. They resist an appearance that already seems preconceived, prefabricated. Often these things or their arrangement may appear inconspicuous, harmless. There is something improvised, something random about the way they appear. But they are not the result of chance or of careless action. A certain amount of attention and care went into the way in which they were made or arranged. Obviously, they held importance for their owners. At the same time, they seem as though they could be changed or rearranged. They share the temporality of the ones using them, the continuous life. Someone repairs something. Someone improvises with something decorates something, reacts intuitively to certain qualities and certain needs. Things that come into being this way seem to resemble a situation more than they appear as solid objects. They are open to the possible. For me it is about the joy in these interventions because they can come about without violating the objects. About the contrast between an instrumental relationship to things and a non-instrumental relationship to things. About things in a state of flux within a world that is striving for perpetuation. This difference has political meaning. In the 19th century, there were many handloom weavers in the agriculturally poor region of northern Bavaria. They lived in small houses consisting of a single room, just large enough for a weaving machine. The house itself made a frame for the loom. The loom made a frame for the weaver. The air was filled with the dust of the yarn. Inside the loom, the weavers worked their way through the grid of the weave. In the middle of the 19th century, a weaver's income was the lowest of all laboring classes. The families worked under conditions of extreme exploitation and self-exploitation. Sources describe the mentality ascribed to the home weavers. They were said to be loners. They were not known to join the Textile Workers Association and did not organize into unions. Innumerable myths. Due to their poverty, every aspect of the weaver's environment was provisional. They were surrounded by the inadequate, the makeshift. The importance of Hambrush, a remote rural town with only a few thousand inhabitants in southern Germany, for weaving and, in particular, the production of scarves, dates back to the 15th century. I never really knew about the weaving tradition in Hambrush, although I grew up only 30 kilometers away. The landscape around the small town is pretty covered with dense forest, making it seem somewhat inaccessible. 
In the 16th and 17th centuries, the mining industry in the region ground to a halt. This resulted in more and more people beginning to work as hand loom weavers. At first, the production was mostly fabric for neckbands worn by townspeople. During the 18th century, the production of then fashionable, colorful handkerchiefs flourished and they were exported to Russia, Italy, Switzerland, and Saxony. Getting the yarns required for the colorful patterns in the handkerchiefs, such as the popular red turks yarn, was costly. Consequently, more and more independent weavers became reliant upon well-funded merchants. After the guilds were abolished in 1830, numerous trading posts were founded, encouraging production on a larger scale. In this time, weaving in the region lost the last traits of craftsmanship and became home industry. The production of scarves led the home weaving industry to create an important economic upturn for the city of Hamrash throughout the 19th century. One can imagine weavers as the first geometricians, exploring the space through knots, proximities, and continuities with their craft. As long as the threads fit to the interlocking grid, they worried little of measurements. Their hands perform strategic manipulations which anticipate topology. Subtle relations remain inside the fabric a forest of knots on the backside of the fabric creates the clear figure on its surface. There are numerous ways crossing the space inside the fabric. None of these ways run straight. They are all intertwined. I like to think of cloth, fabric and textile tissue as models for consciousness. As objects, they are almost abstract. They are the first multiplicities. The world is a pile of laundry. I first visited the textile museum of Hamrash in winter of 2008. In the unheated basement of the museum, different raw materials were spinning and weaving, as well as tools and simple machines were on display. Technological advances in weaving and the development from manufacturing to modern textile industry in Egypt were illustrated. I spent some time on the ground floor taking photographs of the inside of two mechanical looms, which were displayed together with some winding machines and other weaving equipment used by one of the last home weavers of Halbrand up until the 1970s. It was only shortly before the museum closed that I climbed up to the first floor, which was full of poorly lit glass vitrines and shelves with large vertical drawers, which could be pulled out to reveal examples of woolen and cotton scarves once woven in hellbrushes. The first thing I saw in one of the vitrines was a camel brown French poncho made of wool. The edges lined with fine dice pattern in dark brown and white. It could have been on show in an ethnological museum. Other latrines contained cotton saris in bright colors. 
elaborately ornamented and with small, colorful tassels, and black and white prayer rugs of coarse gold. Throughout the 19th century, Hellenbush has had a monopoly on scarf production right up until the First World War when international trade came to a halt. Scarves and shawls woven in Hellenbush were exported to all continents. Around 1900, 100% of the scarves and shawls from Hellenbush were produced for international export. Home weavers from Halmrash produced saris for markets in East India, ponchos to be sold in Peru and Chile, shawls for Egypt, scarves for the West of the U.S., to name a few. The museum walls carry enlarged black and white photographs of a young Sudanese woman working on a clay pot, a scarf with a traditional pattern from Halmrash around her head and Peruvian Indians in ponchos, which clearly came from Hellenbrechts, standing in front of a mountainous Latin American landscape and smiling into the camera. The fabrics on display also bear witness to trade relations with the Ottoman Empire. Woolen waist belts, scarves, and colorful aprons for the Ottoman Empire were some of the most successful articles exported from Hellenbrechts. So-called Turks scarves were traded in great numbers to the whole Middle Eastern region. The sales from this one article alone added up to several million marks. I have tried to trace the paths that the trading of these Turks scarves from the German to the Ottoman Empire took place. It is practically impossible to find out how the designs for the foreign patterns reached the village of Helmbrechts. No personal notes from the weavers have preserved. In the old sample books stored in the attic of the museum, there are no reports about the exchange of foreign patterns, nor is there any information about the ideas that the people in Helmbrechts could have had in regards to the Ottoman culture. Other business relations with the Ottoman Empire appear to be thoroughly documented when you switch from patches and patchwork to a panorama or to the interests and concerns of the German Reich of 1870. It is a switch to the global scale. It is also a change from paths marked by wastefulness to connections built upon economical principles. It means switching from a topological sense of touch to a visual sense that overlooks space without getting close to it from a manifold system of the senses to a geometrical space of engineers, the global technical intervention. Now this becomes a talk about methods that advance without considering sites and neighborhoods, regardless of intricate paths. Scarf production in Helmbrechts was dependent upon the international trade relations and infrastructure between the German Empire and other countries. This international trade was part of a struggle for economic and military dominance between the European powers. At the end of the 19th century, the German Empire was faced with a shortage of colonies and was looking for ways to expand its influence over strategically situated countries. 
The German Empire aimed to bind the Ottoman Empire to itself using a kind of informal imperialism without executing sovereignty. One of the means to obtain this so-called pacifist penetration is trade, cooperation in military and technical areas and cultural policy, like the building of German schools and hospitals. Both Asia Minor and China were considered future world trade regions still open for German competition. The difference to other existing German colonies was that Turkey could be reached by land. Anatolia had vast areas that could be used intensively for agriculture and the country had rich natural resources. The German Empire saw the potential to use it as an inexhaustible granary for the coming 100 years. German politicians thus considered economic engagement in the Near and Far East as policy for the day after tomorrow. From 1970 onwards, the Ottoman Empire became not only a trading partner and market for German products, but also the preferred area for exploitation by German companies and corporations. Eighteen hundred seventy. From eighteen hundred seventy onwards, that was a mistake. German imperialism applied indirect colonial methods in Anatolia. All decisive economical, agricultural, and cultural positions were to be appropriated step by step. Historians refer to this method as the Baghdad Railway Strategy. The German ambassador in Constantinople, Adolf Marshall von Bieberstein, to the Imperial Chancellor, January 3, 1899. In the following, I sincerely and humbly would like to offer my opinion on the planned extension of the train line from Uwa Baghdad. There probably will be complete agreement that the present question is predominantly an economic one. There are nations that consider economic recognition, or to use the modern word, Weltpolitik, as a vital condition, and there are others who do not possess these requirements. For both categories, the words safety and profitability will have different meanings if the capital investment is in a different country. The extension of the Anatol train line to Baghdad is supposed to make the interior of Asia Minor accessible to culture and thus to complete a task that German entrepreneurial spirit has begun successfully. The opening to trade and traffic of foreign countries is one of the eminent practical tasks of German economic policy and the way with which we fulfill this task in the end, depends on the most important economic question, progress or regress. Trade policy is powerless against one risk. If numerous countries, which so far willingly accepted our products that they could not produce themselves, can now, according to the progressing development, manufacture themselves what they bought from us so far, there is only one remedy against this risk, namely to create new markets. This is the purpose of our colonies. A progressive economic policy will not be satisfied with that, but will also approach those countries that are in foreign possession and are still awaiting development. In this regard, Railway construction is not only the most effective, but also the most lucrative way, as it employs German workmanship, as well as supply of the necessary materials, and secures a certain priority with regards to the exploitation of non-developed markets. I claim, confirmed by experience, that a railway line which crosses a large continent 
forms a direct line with the heart of Europe to the Persian Gulf and will become an important factor for international traffic between Europe and East Asia. When I now picture the future, how things will develop, if Germany continues to expand economically in the Orient, the port in Haida Pasha, where a considerable amount of German goods are shipped to be transported to the interior regions of the country, the railway line from there to Baghdad, a German company only using German materials, and at the same time forming the shortest connections for goods and people from the center of Germany to its East Asian territories, then this view into the future is confronted with the moment in which the famous saying that the entire Orient is not worth the bones of a Bulgarian rival for us constitutes an interesting historical reminiscence, but not a historical truth. project of a railway network in the Asian part of Turkey. Advantages. A. The general suitable terrain. Geological formations, which often necessitate special soil enforcement along the tracks of accident, are the exception. B. There are springs and waterways available. C. With a few exceptions, the climate is excellent. Thank you. D. The country can supply skillful laborers, hardly ever tired, robust, modest regarding accommodation and nutrition, happy with very modest wages, but most of all, not only obedient, but also faithful towards their superiors. In addition to the above mentioned advantages is the fact that progressive ideas from Europe have not reached Turkey yet. The country is undamaged by socialist, communist, or other principles. Industrial action is unknown. Everywhere in the country you can find excellent miners, bricklayers, carpenters, joiners, and blacksmiths who all work for modest wages. And there is the legendary hospitality of the Anatolians. In the 1880s, the German Empire had already installed a military mission on Ottoman territory and supplied the Ottoman forces with arms and modern war tactics. Through this, trust in German products and German military discipline was achieved. The Ottoman Empire, stretching as far as the Persian Gulf, required a railway network in order to move troops and to accelerate the industrialization of the country. Contracts for the construction of the railway were granted to the German Empire in order to minimize the influence of the British and the French in Turkey. In 1888, the Ottoman Empire authorizes a corporation under the leadership of Deutsche Bank to build the Anatolian Railway and later extends this contract to create a railway connection to Baghdad. Elaborate structures are realized during the construction project. Tracks are laid and embankments filled, bridges and tunnels as well as station buildings are erected. The majority of plans for the buildings come from stations already built in Germany. The building sections of the railway are supervised by German engineers working for Philipp Holzmann Corporation from Frankfurt. The Ottoman Empire signs contracts that require the, important, the import of all technical equipment and materials from Germany. All necessary repair work is to be executed by German engineers only. The Ottoman Empire even grants a guarantee per kilometer in case the income from the railway does not cover the construction costs. The Deutsche Bank itself was only founded in 1875. The construction of the Baghdad Railway 
is to become one of the largest economical projects of the Young Bank. With the procurance of orders for German companies, it achieves profits of several millions of marks. Berlin, May 8, 1906. Registers office. The present export quantity of cotton from the Pelikian Flats amounts to approximately 40,000 bales. Our company has an approximate share of 20%. Climate and soil allow a considerable increase. In my opinion, one could call it a second Egypt if it were not for specific competing factors of a specific Turkish nature. To date, the product is not top quality because the local population could not yet decide on a rational usage of the soil. And also the seeds are of minor quality largely polluted by sesame. It is particularly difficult to educate the population. I can only see complete success if it was possible to settle German farmers in the Canadian flats. We completely understood that the execution of such a project would at this moment create a welcome opportunity for all enemies of the Baghdad project to suggest to the Sultan an alleged German occupation. In order to prevent this, I have, for the time being, considered the possibility to at least install some model farms with German forces from Palestine. Huguenin promised to initiate this discreetly and to confer with Aif Pasha. Signed, Günther. Manager, German Levantine Cotton Company. The construction management of the Baghdad Railway did not like composite areas. They supported a monoculture. Their story is that of the precarious task of conquering a landscape. In this story, money, power, knowledge, and goods appear as things, things that can be understood. They are dead. They can be imitated. That makes them desirable. The railway network is to cross the landscape like a large interconnected machine. Within this machine, vehicles move with the utmost efficiency. The tracks describe the shortest possible line through the landscape. The photographs shot by the engineers show this ideal line. Hints of it can also be found in the language used in the correspondences of the participating enterprises. From the train, they look out at this cut landscape as if it were a panorama. But the line unravels. There are numerous other tracks above and below the railway network. During construction of the railway, the engineers usually lived in tents. They take up a nomadic lifestyle a traditional way of life disappearing simultaneously with the progressive arrival of traffic in the landscape. There are only a few photographs of the engineers' campsites. In most of them, the fabric used for the tents is torn. Humans were dressing themselves before they were able to erect buildings. They dressed in soft fabrics before they were able to erect solid constructions. Fabrics are soft and hard at the same time. They are less hard than hard things, nearly as liquid as liquids. German Levantine Cotton Company, number four, sender report. 
Und die Goldmember sucht Deutsche Bank. Weil Adela reported in the letter of November 17th, the chimney has been put on. Today, local mobile and main transmission will be running for the first time. If everything works well with the press, we hope to start operating on the 25th. We received a telegram from Adana on December 2nd that the press cylinder head was damaged, and on December 3rd that the new press cylinder head was necessary. We learn from the telegram received today that the press has come to a standstill, so the damage could obviously not be repaired on the spot. A new press cylinder head has been ordered from America immediately. It should take at least two months before it can arrive in Adana. Thus we have to take into account that our installation will not operate at all this season. Dresden, December 7th, 1905. Yours sincerely. Frankfurt, August 27th, 1912. Confidential. Deutsche Bank, Secretary's Office, Berlin. Baghdad Railway, armed robberies. On July 28th, 30 Bedouins of the Bagara tribe robbed the transport section of my engineers of the 20th section near Abu Ksuba, south of Kilometer 900, of 16 camels with 68 sacks. Now, Bedouins of the same tribe attacked and robbed the work camp of the section. Material partly destroyed, partly taken. Stop. The few soldiers allocated to the section refused to attack the robbers. Stop. As staking out the section impossible, without freight animals, and because of the successful robberies of the Bedouins, no laborers and camel drivers will work for us. I had to stop work. Stop. With colonialist ideas growing stronger towards the turn of the century, German interests in the Ottoman Empire soon exceeded the mere economic sector. The German emperor took personal interest in the idea of using Anatolia as a semi colony in order to stretch German influence right to the Persian Gulf. The main goal was to reach the oil fields of Mesopotamia. The First World War was already in sight. The German army had to be motorized and needed oil. At the outbreak of World War I, the railway had not yet reached Baghdad. A section of the train, of the track crossing the Taurus Mountains, connecting Konya to the Adana Plain, is still to be completed. The Ottoman Empire urges the German construction company to install provisional bridges to enable the movement of troops. Hardly any of the photographs from the various archives of the Baghdad Railway show anything other than the successful control of material and landscape. There is one photograph which points in a different direction. Again, it shows an accurately aligned bare embankment. It cuts a clear curve through the Anatolian landscape, passing the remains of a house. Towards the left side of the photograph, there are two figures. It is not exactly clear what they are doing. They stand there, slightly tilted, as if falling out of their own axis. It looks as if they were starting a dance. Also, I have seen much of Meissen Pasha and his wife. He is the head of the Baghdad Railway Construction. I call, then dine at a big dinner party. Baghdad has grown and felt stuff. 
and yesterday afternoon he took me all over the railway works, deeply interesting, and also deeply impressive to the imagination. The slow tigress and the native boats loaded with steel rails, the steam cranes working under the palm trees, the great locomotives of the last pattern standing in all stages of completion in the middle of a devastated palm garden, the blue-clad, ragged Arabs working and singing as they worked and bored, and among them the decisive military Germans, sharp of word, straight of carriage. It was the old East meeting the newest West and going down before it. But the difficulties, they have to import everything and cannot use the water without straining because it is salt. For lack of stone, they must cast blocks of concrete. For lack of sand, there is not even enough sand in Arabia, it seems. They must crush pebbles. Then to station. There's only a good ship fitted up for the station until they see how big a station they will need. If they get permission for Basra, the station will have to be bigger. The station fittings of teeth because of white ants. In one of the sheds, we saw the bells for the station. Great bells stamped Baghdad. He hauled some men over the coals for using rails to hammer on. So walked back, drank beer at the Hotel Baghdad Railway. Thank you. That was it.